In this video tutorial, we will discuss the circulatory and respiratory systems. The job of the circulatory system is to distribute oxygen and nutrients throughout the body while carrying away waste. There are three parts to the system. The first is the blood, the second is the heart, and the third are the blood vessels. If you recall, tissues are a collection of similar cells that perform a specific function. And in animals, there are four major types. Blood is a type of connective tissue and it circulates throughout the body. When bright red in color, it indicates that the blood carries a lot of oxygen inside of it. When it doesn't carry a lot of oxygen inside, it is a dark red color. Blood generally has a neutral pH that's slightly basic, and the average blood volume in an adult is between 4 to 6 liters. In general, there are four components to blood. We generally can't see these four components because they're mixed well with each other. But by spinning them in a centrifuge, we can separate them out based on their densities. So here we have some mud suspended in water. By placing them into a centrifuge that spins them around, all the heavier, more dense particles get spun out towards the edges, while the lighter ones remain at the top. And there it is, the mud settles to the very bottom, leaving the water much clearer than what it looked like before. When you do this with blood, we get three distinct layers. The first is blood plasma, which is a straw-colored electrolyte. If you recall, electrolytes are aqueous solutions that conduct electricity. Blood plasma is protein and nutrient-rich, and carries waste, respiratory gases, and blood cells. The next layer are the white blood cells and platelets, and then finally we have red blood cells at the bottom. Red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes, have a donut-like shape. They are unique among cells in that they do not contain a nucleus. However, they do contain a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin allows red blood cells to bind onto four oxygen molecules that are held in place by four iron atoms. It is these iron atoms in the hemoglobin that give blood its red color. Because oxygen doesn't dissolve very well in blood plasma, it requires this hemoglobin in order to be transported around the body. Carbon dioxide, however, is a lot more soluble in blood plasma, so hemoglobin is not required to carry the CO2. At the same time, some molecules like carbon monoxide and cyanide bond more strongly to the hemoglobin than oxygen, and that's why these substances are poisonous to us. Carbon monoxide poisoning occurs when it bonds onto the hemoglobin, preventing oxygen from latching on instead. And without oxygen, we suffocate. Now, red blood cells come from stem cells located in the bone marrow, and they'll typically live for approximately 120 days, so about four months. Platelets are tiny cell fragments essential to the blood clotting process. When you get injured, you start to bleed. The damaged cells at the injury site send out signals to the platelets, which activates them and makes them sticky. These sticky platelets then attach themselves to the injured area, causing other blood cells to stick to that area, creating a blood clot. And this blood clot prevents further bleeding. White blood cells, also known as leukocytes, are the only type of blood cell that contains a nucleus. These infection-fighting cells are able to identify foreign bodies, such as invading bacteria or viruses, and neutralize them. Furthermore, they are the only type of cells that can leave the blood vessels, squeezing in between other cells in order to fight an infection. This is a video of a white blood cell chasing after a bacteria. It is squeezing in between other cells in order to get to it. And when it does capture it, it surrounds it and engulfs it. Once the bacteria is captured, the lysosomes inside release their digestive enzymes and destroy and break down the bacteria. Now, red blood cells have a protein on their surface called an antigen. There are two major types of antigens, A and B. Depending on which antigen your blood cells have determines what blood type you have. This is the reason you can't just donate your blood to anyone. If a red blood cell has the wrong type of antigen, a white blood cell will recognize it as being foreign and attack it. So these antigens almost act like a passport, telling the white blood cells who belongs and who doesn't. If your blood type has no antigens, you can donate your blood to anybody. But you can only receive blood from others with the same blood type, O. On the other hand, if you have both types of antigens, you can receive blood from anybody. But you would only be allowed to donate blood to other people with type AB. As such, blood type AB are called the universal recipients because they can get blood from anybody. Well, blood type O are called universal donors because they can donate their blood to anybody. Now, when it comes to the immune system, there are two broad categories, acquired immunity and passive immunity. 
Acquired immunity occurs when you're exposed to various antigens, so something that would cause an illness. In those situations, your immune system will build a defense against those specific antigens in case you encounter them in the future. Immunity. By exposing you to a, by exposing you to a dead or weakened version of the disease-causing agent, vaccines train your immune system to recognize these antigens in the future. That way you can mount a more effective defense if you ever encounter that disease again. With passive immunity, antibodies that are produced in another body are passed on to your own. So for instance, newborn babies typically do not have acquired immunity. They are usually protected by the uterus and have not been exposed to any disease-causing agents yet. So when they leave the protection of the uterus, they can be more susceptible to disease. However, breast milk contains antibodies that are passed on from mother to child. And this grants the baby temporary immunity to many of the diseases that mother acquired over her life for usually 6 to 12 months. This is one of the advantages of being breastfed rather than formula fed, as baby formula does not contain any antibodies, but breast milk does. There are three major types of blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, while veins carry blood towards the heart. Because blood is pumped away from the heart through these arteries, the arteries have higher blood pressure than in veins, which return to the heart. As such, the walls of arteries are much thicker than the walls of veins. Capillaries, on the other hand, are the smallest blood vessels and can often only allow one single red blood cell to pass through at any given time. This network of blood vessels allows nutrients, waste, and gases to diffuse between tissue cells and the capillaries. Being so thin allows them to drop off nutrients and pick up waste a lot easier. Now the heart is responsible for circulating blood around the body. And there are two major circuits. The one at the top is called the pulmonary circuit. Here, blood picks up oxygen from the lungs and travels along in a vein back towards the heart. The heart uses up some of that oxygen and then pumps the rest of it back out through this artery towards the rest of your body. In this loop, called the systemic circuit, Oxygen is then dropped off at the various body parts, and carbon dioxide is picked up. From there, the blood travels back towards the heart in a vein before it's pumped back out through this artery towards the lungs. And now we're back in the pulmonary circuit, where the carbon dioxide is dropped off in the lungs to be breathed out, and oxygen is put back into the blood when it's breathed in. And that is how blood circulates in our body, kind of making a figure eight as it travels around these two circuits. Now when you donate blood, do you think the nurse takes the blood from your arteries or from your veins? Remember, arteries move away from the heart, so they both begin with an A, arteries, away, while veins move towards the heart. Well, the nurse will usually take the blood from the vein. They don't want to take it from the artery because that contains a lot of oxygen. So if they're taking blood from you that contains oxygen, that's oxygen that your body's not getting, and you start to suffocate. But if they take it away from the vein, that's carbon dioxide waste that's carrying, so it's okay if it leaves your body. We're trying to get rid of that carbon dioxide anyway. Now, every time the heart beats, blood is pushed through the arteries. The force of the blood acting on the walls of the arteries is called blood pressure. Your blood pressure can be measured with a sphygmal manometer, also known as blood pressure cuffs. High blood pressure can indicate a clogged or blocked artery. The heart must pump harder to push blood past the blockage, and this of course can lead to an increased risk of heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, and many other health issues. The systolic pressure is the higher value. This pressure is what is occurring when your heart squeezes. The diastolic pressure is the lower value. That is the pressure of your blood vessels when your heart relaxes. By looking at these two numbers, you can identify where you are on this chart and whether or not you have high blood pressure, normal blood pressure, or low blood pressure. As was mentioned earlier, if you have a high blood pressure, it could be because your, the walls of your blood vessels have too much cholesterol or fat buildup, so you have to really change your diet at that point. So in a situation like this where the blood vessels are clogged up, the blood can't flow very easily, there's a backup, there's a buildup of pressure, resulting in high blood pressure. To treat this issue, the doctor may put in a stent. So what a stent does is it's a small little wire that they pull through your blood vessels, and then they bring in this little device here that gets inflated. Once it inflates, 
they've got this nice little structure that widens up the blood vessel again and then now you have a blood vessel that is no longer obstructed all right then they retract the wire and you're good to go this type of surgery can be quite invasive they have to thread that wire through your blood vessels in order to get the stent to where the blockage is uh, located so my recommendation avoid all these issues altogether and please eat healthy so as we can see the respiratory system works very closely with the circulatory system in order to obtain and distribute oxygen for the body while removing carbon dioxide waste once again, the top part of the circulatory system is called the pulmonary circulation, while the bottom half is called the systemic circulation. Pulmonary circulation is where they pick up the oxygen and drop off the CO2, while the systemic circulation is where they drop off the oxygen while picking up the CO2. Because blood is being pumped away from the heart, this is called an artery, and this artery, because it's so close to the heart, as it squeezes, experiences high levels of pressure, while the veins move blood towards the heart. Since they are at the very end of the circuit and far away from the initial squeeze of the heart, there's very little blood pressure here. But once the blood enters the heart and gets pumped away from it through this artery back towards the lungs, again we experience high blood pressure here because it's being pushed back towards the lungs where it can drop off the CO2 and pick up oxygen. With the respiratory system, it begins in the nasal cavity and the mouth. Here the air is warmed, moistened, and filtered. So you have nose hair and mucus in your nose and in your throat in order to capture any foreign particles that might be coming in. That filters the air to help clean it up. Because gas exchange doesn't work well in cold and dry areas, the air must be moistened and warmed as well before it enters into the rest of the tract. From here, the air passes through the pharynx, which is known as the throat, and travels down the trachea, also known as the windpipe. The trachea then splits off into two branches called bronchi. So air can go in through one lung, or the other. Epithelial cells line the trachea and the bronchi to produce mucus. The mucus traps dirt, bacteria, and other unwanted objects, while the cilia, little hair-like projections, help to push the mucus out of the throat. That way, these items do not end up in your lungs, giving you an infection. From there, each bronchus branches off into smaller branches called bronchioles, and at the end of these bronchioles are little air sacs called alveoli. The singular is alveolus. Each air sac has a network of capillaries wrapped around it, allowing for gas exchange to occur. So here in the lungs, carbon dioxide is dropped off from the blood into the air sacs, so it can be breathed out when you exhale. Meanwhile, the oxygen that was inside these air sacs diffuses into the blood, so it can be carried back to the heart and distributed to the rest of the body. The trachea, also known as the windpipe, is supported by rings of cartilage. Now, cartilage is the material that's found in your nose. It's rigid enough to give the structure some shape, but at the same time providing it with some flexibility. In situations where the airway may be blocked, a tracheotomy can be performed to aid in breathing. That's where you cut in between the cartilage, creating a hole called a stoma, and that will allow you to bypass any obstructions or issues with the upper part of the respiratory tract, and air can go directly into the trachea, so that can go straight to the lungs from there. So with this person over here, it looks like they lost a part of their throat to cancer, because they no longer have the ability to bring air in from their mouth or their nose, they need something called a stoma in order to allow air in. You'll also notice that unfortunately, due to the addictive nature of cigarettes, even though cancer was probably likely caused by cigarettes, they still need to smoke, and so they're smoking through their stoma at this point. Over here, Christopher Reeves was paralyzed in a horse riding accident, and so his muscles could no longer help him to breathe in and breathe out. And so doctors cut a breathing stoma in for him, and he was attached to an external ventilator, and this machine pumps air in directly to his throat and into his lungs, and then allows it to come back out again. Because these stomas bypass the first part of the respiratory tract, what kind of chronic or long-term health issues do you think these two individuals face? Now that the air goes directly into the trachea and then the lungs, what important functions are missing? Well, first, the air is no longer warmed or moistened, and breathing cold, dry air is not particularly comfortable. But most importantly, they've lost the ability to filter a lot of the air that comes in. Normally, you would have nose hairs and mucus in order to trap dirt and dust and bacteria. But now that the air is coming straight through, these people are more susceptible to getting lung infections. Now, as we saw in a previous lesson, diffusion is the random movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We call this a concentration gradient. 
And so it's important to have the concentration of oxygen inside these air sacs, these alveoli, always be higher than the concentration of oxygen inside the blood vessels. That way oxygen will naturally diffuse from the air sacs into the bloodstream. Meanwhile, the opposite is true for the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide must always be in higher concentration inside the bloodstream than it is in the air sacs in order for the CO2 to diffuse out so that we can breathe it out of the alveoli, then up the bronchioles, up the trachea, and then out the mouth and nose. Now, gas exchange is most effective in a moist environment. As was previously mentioned, gas exchange is most effective in a moist environment. As such, a thin layer of moisture coats each of the alveoli. But when it comes to aquatic animals like fish, instead of lungs, many of them have gills. And these gills are directly exposed to the aqueous environment. Fish can then pass the oxygen-rich water through their gills by constantly swimming or opening and closing their mouths. And as that oxygen-rich water passes by their gills, they drop off oxygen into the bloodstream while removing carbon dioxide. With worms, they can exchange gases through their skin and must secrete a mucus in order to keep themselves moist. Meanwhile, frogs and other amphibious creatures, those that live on both land and in the water, well, they can breathe through their skin in water or they can use their lungs when they're on land. Now, the process of bringing air into our lungs is called inhalation and the process of pushing air out of the lungs is called exhalation. Together, we call this breathing. When you inhale, a muscle called the diaphragm pulls down. Just as you would pull in a syringe to suck up water, the diaphragm pulls down to bring in air. And when it's time to exhale, the diaphragm pushes up to squeeze the air back out. And that concludes our lesson on the respiratory system.